Good morning, everyone, and welcome to a webinar entitled Teaching Research Processes with presenters William Badke and Stacey Trasenkos. This webinar is co-sponsored by the American Theological Library Association, ATLA, and Holy Apostles College and Seminary. My name is Sebastian Mafud, and I'm the director of ITEST. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, ITEST, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. ITEST explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. ITEST's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and science. faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. Before I introduce our first presenter, Father John Goucher will offer our opening prayer. Father Goucher is a retired Redemptorist priest who this year celebrates 60 years of religious vows. He lives at the Redemptorist Monastery in Ligori, Missouri. Father Goucher? Thank you. Yes, I am Father John Goucher, Redemptorist. Here at St. Clement's Center in Lagori, Missouri, on the same campus as Lagori Publications. And uh, I have attended a number of these sessions and, have, and I'm very happy to be here today. I have to leave early, but um, I'm very happy to be here today. Let us pray. We pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit. Enlighten us to share the knowledge we have and the love of God we feel. Help us always to seek the truth and to help one another in opening doors and in building bridges and a pathway toward a, a better future for the whole human family and for the earth. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Goucher. And now I'm delighted to introduce our first presenter. William Badke grew up in Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada. That makes this an international webinar. After completing a BA at the University of British Columbia in 1971 and a Master of Divinity in 1975, and a Master of Theology in 1977. He taught at a college in Nigeria, West Africa for two years before returning to teach at Northwest Baptist Theological College in Vancouver, British Columbia. In 1985, he earned a Master of Library Science degree at the University of British Columbia and currently serves as Associate Librarian for Associated Canadian Theological Schools and Information Literacy at Trinity Western University in Langley, British Columbia. He has published extensively in the area of information literacy, as well as fiction and spirituality. His column on information literacy, InfoLit Land, appears every two months in Online Searcher and, as of 2023, in Computers and Libraries. Mr. Badke's presentation is entitled, Engaging Faculty in Teaching Research Processes. Mr. Badke, take it away. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, Sebastian and I actually go back several years, and uh, I've always appreciated his support and encouragement uh, over that time. Uh, I'm really happy to be able to present this material today because this is something that I've had a passion for for uh, many, many years. And uh, I've developed ideas over that time that I think are going to be helpful to you. I'd like to start right away with sharing my screen because I think we need to leap into this as quickly as we can. I want to start with a few premises. Uh, we live in a highly information confused world. I don't think anyone doubts that. Uh, it is crazy out there when it comes to information, quasi-information, misinformation, disinformation. Uh, it's a crazy world. The assured findings of science are doubted by many. Uh, I came across a student, a uh, prospective student at Trinity Western uh, a while back, uh, who told me that there was no point studying science because science is corrupt. 
uh, it's it's full of falsehood, and no one can trust anything in science. Sorry, Stacy. Uh, and uh, we had quite a conversation about this, but I was really concerned that this view was so deeply embedded in his mind that you can't trust science anymore at all, ever. Uh, very sad. Students overwhelmingly lack the skills to navigate today's information. Uh, this is something that I have uh, really struggled with for, for decades now, that while they are absolute whizzes on texting, on social media, on uh, all kinds of things, they really don't how to know how to navigate the world of information in a way that is intelligent, critical, uh, understanding of what's out there and what uh, pitfalls they may find along the way. Information glut uh, is a real problem. Quality is uncertain. Misinformation is common. Uh, it's a big problem. And this one you might wonder about, but it's something that I've seen for almost 40 years now. Academia seems unable to equip students with research skills. It just seems to be something that faculty just do not seem to know how to do. Uh, I was talking to one of my fellow seminary professors a while back, and he said, uh, I'd really like to develop my students' skills, but uh, frankly, I, I don't even know what I'd tell them. I don't know how I would teach that. How can you teach research skills? And uh, of course, you can. So does any of this matter? Uh, I'm going to set a theological foundation because that's, of course, part of the purpose of this webinar. And I think you'll find it's very much in, in accord uh, with the kind of thinking I've already seen expressed this morning. Uh, our creation in God's image means that our minds mirror his. Not that we're some kind of perfect mirror of him. Uh, you know, it's through a glass darkly kind of stuff. But there's some kind of correspondence between our minds and the mind of God. And God has created us in this way. Our ability to communicate with him and others demonstrates this. Uh, the fact that he has communicated to us in his word, that we communicate with him through prayer, that we communicate with one another. Uh, you know, one of the great commonalities of the human race is that no matter what language we speak, our minds are able to communicate with other minds. And that's because of our creation in the image of God. The other thing is, with our minds, we're made to investigate and persuade with evidence. Uh, this is part of our being. It's part of our ethos as humans. First uh, Peter 3.15 talks about the fact that we need to be prepared at all times to uh, provide a reason for our faith, for what we believe and why we believe it. Uh, another grand example is First Corinthians 15, where Paul goes out of his way to enlist eyewitness evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Uh, he does it in a deliberate kind of way and even says further on in the chapter uh, that if all this evidence points to something that isn't true, that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then we might as well all go home. There's, there's nothing here for us. Uh, so Paul uh, is, is using investigation, persuasion with evidence uh, in a dramatic way to defend the resurrection. Knowing the truth isn't automatic. We know that. It's, it's not something that uh, just comes to us. Uh, it's something that we have to find, something that we have to learn. Uh, it's not automatic, but it's essential. Uh, Jesus said, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. Uh, obviously, this is, this is an essential. Going with the flow is not an option if we don't want to be blown about. The famous passage, Ephesians 4.15 blown about by every wind of doctrine. That's a lot of what we see today in this world. Uh, people blown about by this idea, that idea, uh, none of which are credible. And if they had proper information and research skills, they'd be able to ground themselves rather than getting blown around like a ship in the midst of a storm. So here's, here's my basic theological premise. Our theology tells us that the skillful navigation of our information world to solve problems, to find truth, and ultimately work for a better world is foundational to our creation in the image of God. I think that's, that's basic. Uh, that's something that we have to adhere to if we're going to have a theology about information, knowledge, and research. Now, given that premise that seeking knowledge, seeking truth, 
is part of our creation in the image of God. Uh, if the education of our students fills their heads but doesn't build their research abilities, we're actually failing those students. They were made to explore, discover, problem solve, and seek ultimate answers. Uh, if we're not doing that, if we're not consciously engaging students in a plan to develop them as researchers, as people who can handle information well, then they're in a dangerous world, and they're also not fulfilling their purpose. Now, how do we develop students as researchers now? <clears throat> the common practice is what we call in the library world the one-shot. It's an hour or so of librarian-led instruction, often based around an upcoming assignment, and mainly focused on database searching skills. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, the prof says, you know, come in for an hour, show them the databases. Uh, they've got an assignment that's coming up, and uh, here's what it is. Help them to find the information they need. Uh, the one shot is is really reassuring to a lot of people. It, it it tells us that we're doing something. Professors feel like student research skill development is happening. You know, I, I let the library into my classroom for an hour. Uh, I feel good about that because I'm helping students to learn how to do research. The one shot also constitutes an epic fail. Sorry for the bold orange, but I want to make a point. The one shot is a failure. It's the most common way in which we instruct students in research, and it's a failure. So why? The task of developing a student researcher is more like teaching a new language than teaching someone how to drive. Uh, I can teach somebody how to drive in a, in a week or two or three, at least up to the point where they can uh, then, you know, uh, take a driving test and, and learn from then on. Uh, it's not an essentially challenging kind of task. Uh, teaching a student how to be a researcher is more like learning a new language. Uh, learning a new language takes a lot of time, and you don't really get proficient until you've been in it for a year or two or three. Uh, and so it's it's something where you have to be iterative. iterative. You have to constantly be helping students to develop their skills more and more until they get to a point where they really feel like they are able to accomplish something. The one shot takes the responsibility off academics, off professors, to develop genuinely able research, student researchers. Uh, I get this all the time. Professors say, it's not my job to teach students how to do research. They should have learned that before in high school or undergraduate if they're graduate students. They should have learned it. Uh, it. It's not my responsibility to teach them that. And uh, the fact is that professors are professors because they are the students' primary teachers. Uh, teaching content, uh, teaching a little bit of critical thinking with content is great. It's, it's important. It's something we've done for centuries. But it's not the be-all and end-all of education. If we're not helping students to develop the research skills, uh, then I don't believe we're actually fulfilling all of our responsibilities as professors. More on that in a little while. So the one shot prioritizes the knowledge imparted by faculty, that's the main thing, over the task to develop these student researchers. If we say one hour is enough, then we're saying it's not a priority. Uh, we, it'd be nice to have, it'd be nice to do, but I can only really spare an hour. And a lot of study of the one shot is, has demonstrated that it provides minimal learning. Uh, students really don't gain very much from a one shot. And uh, uh, you can say, well, let's do lots of one shots. Every class will have a one shot. But students start to tune it out because they've heard it before. Uh, they, they know how to use that database now but they haven't learned the basic research skills they need. So if we believe humans were created by God to explore, discover, find the truth and make a better world, I'm really big on this idea of making a better world through research. Um, I think that's something we need to aspire to. And if we believe higher education, especially in a Christian setting, needs to inculcate in its students significant abilities to navigate their information world so that their created goals can be achieved, so that they can seek out, find the truth, so they can discover, uh, so that they can solve big problems, make a better world, etc. If we believe that, then we need to get serious about teaching research processes. 
Uh, this is not something that we can just slough off and uh, leave behind uh, and, uh, you know, sort of say, well, you know, student research is really bad, but it can't be helped. Uh, they they should have they should have learned this before, and I, I'm sorry that they didn't. Uh, I hear professors say, well, students are just lazy. Uh, they, or students really aren't applying themselves. Or students should be learning about research by doing research. Uh, that theory has been called research by osmosis. You, you immerse yourself in the research world and it, it permeates into your, into your body. Uh, none of that is actually accurate. None of that is true. Students don't learn to do research by doing research. Uh, they don't generally get the kind of skills they need uh, in high school and undergraduate. Uh, they just don't. And that's been my experience year after year. I get a lot of graduate students uh, coming in. Uh, this is their first course. I teach a research course uh, for graduate students in our seminary. I also teach an undergraduate one and a, and a doctor ministry one. But uh, the, uh, the master's students uh, come in and they are utterly baffled about what I'm talking about. Uh, what is this this thing about research? And I'm trying to follow your instructions, but this is really hard. And I'm thinking, this is really basic. This is this is what you need to do in order to address a research issue and and make it work for you. So I think we have to get serious. We have to do something about this. So what are research processes? Uh, this is a term that I developed in conjunction with a, uh, a publisher uh, as we were trying to express what exactly I was talking about here. Now, research processes, uh, I have to give a bit of a disclaimer here. My knowledge base is uh, in the research landscape is primarily informational research. So the stuff you do in history and theology essays, but also literature reviews in the sciences and social sciences. Uh, but my whole approach actually comes from a scientific research model. Um, that's that's where I start. And uh, here's a, a really blunt and basic and simplistic, but I guess it's what we need to start with, model for research. You start with a question or a hypothesis or a problem you want to solve or a thesis or whatever it is. You start with something that is a puzzler that you want to resolve. Uh, to that, you apply data. You gather data, whether it's uh, informational data or even scientific data, uh, and you synthesize the data. You start making sense of it. And for scientific research, that's when all the tables and charts come out and, and uh, various uh, mathematical calculations come out uh, based on the data. And once you put it all together, uh, then you do some analysis. You have to figure out, what is this data actually saying? Uh, what does it actually communicate to me about the question? And then once you've done that, you have information, which is processed data. And out of that comes conclusions and recommendations. So this is a basic kind of model for research that I've used with my students uh, in theology courses, in biblical studies courses, uh, in uh, counseling courses. And uh, it works just as well as, uh, as uh, it does in a basic way in, in science. So what is involved? First thing is understanding the knowledge landscape. Now, this one is big, it's huge, and it's something that is often not recognized. Uh, 30 years ago, our knowledge landscape was really quite defined. Uh, we had books, we had periodicals, uh, we had all kinds of other written communication like diaries and letters and, you know, who knows what. Uh, so we had all of that in the written form, and then we had media which is basically audio and visual. And uh, that, was, that was it. That was our knowledge landscape. And we could define it. We could say, this is what it looks like. And not only was it fairly well defined, but it also had gatekeepers. Uh, no publisher publishes something that doesn't, first of all, accord with the publisher's own uh, vision of their publishing house. And secondly, uh, has no hope of, of ever uh, being of any interest in the public. Uh, so uh, publishers would go through the material, uh, peer review would happen with, with journal article submissions. And uh, so there was quality control. There were gatekeepers that would say, yes, it will be published, or no, this will not. 
or no, this won't be published unless you revise it in these ways. And uh, so there was a measure of control over much of information. Doesn't mean it was perfect, but at least there was something happening there. Uh, with the coming of the World Wide Web, and I think we basically look at 1989 as, uh, as the start of that, uh, there was a knowledge explosion, but it wasn't the kind of explosion that gatekeepers could in any possible way keep up with. Anyone can publish on the internet. And I've told my students, any fool can publish on the internet, and a lot of them do. Uh, you can, I mean, you can send out a tweet that, uh, or an X or whatever they call it now. You can send out a tweet that, uh, you know, is absolutely devastating to people or promotes a, a big, terrible idea. Uh, and no one's going to stop you. You just do it. You just send it out. Uh, people can create websites. They can uh, they can do all kinds of stuff, and no one's going to stop them. Uh, the only time you get stopped is if you are really really dangerous. Uh, otherwise, the knowledge in landscape is is full of all kinds of ungate kept material. So that's the first thing we have to understand that knowledge landscape. It has to make sense to us. Uh, what is what is good, what is bad, what is helpful, what is not. Second thing, doing research design. <clears throat> this is a big, big part of, of everything that I teach in research processes. Uh, students very generally fail at research design. I have to write a paper on whatever, polar bears. I'm going to read up on polar bears. I'm going to learn everything I can about polar bears. I understand they're under a great deal of stress right now. Maybe I'll write about that. And there's no plan, there's no, there's no design, there's no determination of what is it exactly that I want to do here. So research design, having a working knowledge of your topic, uh, being able to understand the basics of whatever it is you're dealing with, and then out of that developing a research question or a thesis uh, that, that will guide you, that is your goal. Uh, students working without a goal in research generally flounder and uh, if you don't have a goal, you're generally going to hit it, which is nothing. Uh, and I also encourage students <clears throat> to develop a preliminary outline of their research path. Uh, where are you going with this? Uh, what do you plan to cover? And so I, I suggest to them, you know, three or four points that tell you this, this is where I'm going to go. This is my path. This is essentially my blueprint for the research I plan to do. Now, a lot of students complain about this. They say, well, I, I can't possibly know what question I'm going to ask. I'm just at the beginning of the research. I can't possibly know what kind of outline I'm going to have. But what I'm telling them is aim for something. You can modify it. It can be a preliminary research question or thesis. It can be a preliminary outline. But start with something. Uh, take a direction. Because if you don't, you're going to be doing what uh, students come to me with. I, I've been working on this project for 15 hours. I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't understand anything about it. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. The prof didn't explain it. And there's no research design. That's the problem. Uh, you have to get down to doing that. So uh, that's something that research processes uh, demand. Emphasis on research as problem-based or issue-based or some kind, finding some kind of a solution to something. Uh, a lot of my graduate students have never heard of the idea that a research project is any more, anything more than looking up a, a narrow subject, uh, getting to know it as well as you possibly can, and then writing it up. And uh, I ask students, why, you know, why do your professors uh, assign research projects? And uh, they say, well, because uh, they, they want us to study up on something in more detail. And I'm thinking, no, no, no. I mean, that might happen, but that's not the point. The point is, research has to be problem-based. It has to be something that you can't just look up in a book. You know, what did Aquinas teach on so-and-so? Well, look it up. It's there. Uh, but it has to be problem-based. It has to be something that requires analysis that may have, uh, you know, several points of view around it, uh, you know, so that it's a difference between a student writing on the plight of, uh, of homeless students seeking an education. So uh, high school students who can't really get a proper education because they're homeless. Uh, you can write on that. You can look it up. There's lots of information on that. 
But a problem-based research question would be something like, how can a community uh, develop the educational potential of homeless students? In which you have to look at the various options, and then you have to come up with some kind of a solution that requires analysis. Any research that is not does not demand analysis and critical thinking, that is not uh, focused on a single uh, answer that you can easily find, is not research at all. It's, it's just not. Then, sophisticated strategic searching for relevant information. This is written information, red, red research data, if you're doing a research uh, project, human per, per, persons uh, kind of thing, or a scientific research project. You have to search, you have to find strategically the relevant information you want. And I stress relevant because that is so very important. The world is full of information. When you're doing a research project, most of it is not relevant to you. And then critical evaluation of found resources for quality and relevance. Those are the two pillars of found resources. Is it good quality? Is the data of good quality? Is the information that I am finding in the various resources of good quality? And then does it have direct relevance to my research question? Uh, I, I do a little mechanical thing here, which I think uh, might seem a little simplistic, but it actually works. When I say, I say to students initially, when you're, when you're searching for information on your topic in a database, uh, draw the words, the search terms you're going to use directly out of your research question or use uh, you know, uh, synonyms of those words. Uh, draw the words right out of your research questions. So if you're dealing with, uh, you know, how can you best uh, uh, enable uh, homeless adolescents to uh, uh, get a good education, uh, you can put homeless bracket uh, youth or adolescents bracket education. So you're drawing the words right out of your question, and that's where you find the relevance happening. So it's a daunting task, though. Uh, how, do, how do you teach this? Uh, first of all, there aren't enough librarians. Uh, even if you put li a librarian in your class for one hour in a semester uh, in every class, uh, there probably aren't enough librarians to do that. You're burning them out. Uh, librarians are getting burned out doing these one-shots. And they're frustrated because they know that the one-shots really aren't accomplishing very much. Faculty have not bought into significant involvement. And this is, this is sad to me to say, because I, I really appreciate our faculty. I, I just think they're, they're such wonderful people. But they haven't bought into significant involvement in teaching research processes. Uh, they say they haven't got enough time. I'm going to take away from other things I need to do. I can't be spending my time teaching students how to research. Uh, lack of belief that research processes can be taught. I get this often. Uh, you can't teach this stuff. You'll have to learn it by experience. You can't teach it. Uh, well, I've been teaching it for 40 years, and I can, I can guarantee you, you can teach it. And then lack of skill to teach research processes effectively. And uh, for some professors, uh, you know, they, they don't remember their own journey of becoming a researcher. That was a long time ago. And uh, so, you know, how do I help somebody on that journey now? I, I don't even know what I'd tell them, as that one professor said to me. To get research processes education deeply into the curriculum might create upheaval in higher ed and support the teaching of content. Uh, this is a big problem. Uh, here I've got this bright idea. We're going to teach students how to do research. And I'm going to mess up higher education. I'm going to, I'm going to create an upheaval. And above all, I'm going to subvert the teaching of content. I'm going to take so much time with my wonderful scheme that uh, content is going to suffer along the way. And uh, these students are not going to learn the things that they need to learn. So here's a what if. What if we could find a path to teaching research processes that span the curriculum and brought real change to student abilities? Two things here, spanning the curriculum. So pretty much every class uh, is, a, is a stage in the process and brings real change to student abilities. And I mean real change, and I've seen that happen again and again and again. 
The main players in this enterprise would be faculty members rather than librarians. I'm not talking about the only players. Librarians would still be players, but the main players would be faculty members rather than librarians. There would be minimal disruption to faculty teaching plans and limited drain on faculty time and resources. So what if those were the case? Do you think you might buy into it? Especially since the goal is really great. You know, enabling students to be skilled in seeking out, finding information, solving problems, making a better world. If those skills were vitally uh, part of their experience. So, uh, I've been working for almost two decades, actually four decades, working on, on these ideas, but I'm working past two decades on these realities. Teaching research processes can be, cannot be left just to librarians or too few on the ground. There has to be a way to enlist faculty, the primary educators, let's never forget that, faculty are the primary educators, to do the work of developing significant student research skills. And this will only work if we don't if we don't dramatically disrupt current educational practices. I am not here to upset the apple cart in any way. So here's the plan. It's actually in two documents, and uh, uh, I I don't know if somebody can put the URL for this into the chat, but if not, you can just email me badkey at twu.ca and. Uh, but two things that I've got. First of all, I've got a book, Teaching Research Processes, Faculty Role in the Development of Skilled Student Researchers. And uh, this book is in its second edition, thanks to uh, Sebastian. I had published it with a major academic publisher uh, who uh, kind of lost interest in it. This was 2012. And uh, so uh, Sebastian suggested I should try to get out of my contract with them and, and publish with him, and I did and uh, kind of wrote the book, uh, revised it from stem to stern, and it was published in 2021 with Onroute Books and Media. By the way, it, uh, the price dropped from $80 to $20, which is fabulous. And the second thing was a faculty workshop series developing student research as the faculty role. Uh, this had its first uh, iteration actually in, <clears throat> in uh, uh, Sebastian's uh, webinars that he asked me to do with, with faculty a number of years ago. And I've kind of reduced it to a four uh, part faculty workshop, which I've done with our own faculty here. So those two platforms, presuppositions for this whole thing. First, faculty members will not be likely to embrace initiatives from a librarian unless those initiatives align strongly with faculty interests. Uh, I'm not gonna come in as some kind of alien and mess up faculty's minds. They, they have to be interested in this. Uh, they have to be uh, seeing that there's some purpose to me interfering with them. Second, cognitive load must be limited. Cognitive load. Uh, if I throw a basketball to you, chances are you'll catch it. If I throw seven basketballs to you at the same time, chances are you won't catch any of them. Uh, cognitive load uh, is the kind of load that your working memory must absorb in order to make sense of something. And if I overload that working memory with all kinds of wonderful ideas, and you should try this and you should try that, your chances are you're not gonna try anything because, oh, this is too much. I, I don't know what to do with all this stuff. So it's gotta be simple. Third, initiatives must recognize with disciplinary differences. Every uh, discipline has its own methods of doing research, its own purposes. That one is actually the easiest one to solve, believe it or not. So here's a summary. This is what a plan is. Faculty would begin by listing the elements they would expect in an excellent student research project. That's beyond correct formatting. So they would write a list. What are the things that I would really like to see in a student project that I would call excellent, excellent that I would give an A or an A plus to? And uh, correct formatting would be in there, but it could be, uh, you know, a, a clear, incisive research question that is problem-based and is researchable. Uh, it could be, uh, you know, uh, uh, use of, of excellent resources that are relevant entirely to the research question. Uh, it could be many things having to do with the structure of the project and so on. Uh, so 
faculty start by, by listing out the stuff that they would really like to see. It's like a rubric with only the excellent uh, part of it uh, listed. And uh, those are the things I would love to see if a student was really doing a good project. So that's the first thing. So faculty would break their existing research assignments into smaller facets, each directed at elements of an excellent research project, elements of number one there. Uh, so that the, the big project broken up into smaller projects. Now, this is very common today. A lot of, a lot of professors do this. Uh, they break the assignment down into portions and students do this part and that part and that part and finally submit the final project. Uh, that's not entirely unusual. And of course, with artificial intelligence now, a lot of faculty are seeing this as a possible path to uh, thwart some of the uh, uh, you know, wholesale borrowing from an AI for a, a final research project. That's not unusual. Here's what's more, um, more less usual. The smaller facets would become teaching tools to develop student research ability, thus focusing more on method or process than on product. You are now moving into the area where the research project becomes part of your instruction, becomes part of what you are teaching your students. A professor would be less an examiner than a mentor. And that distinction is very important. You're not just saying, uh, well, how good is this thing? I guess I'll give it a C uh, or an A or whatever. Uh, I'll write some comments on what, what they didn't do right. Uh, it's, it's different from that. It's a mentor kind of model. So scaffolded or, or faceted assignments are fairly common. Turning it into a training tool for student research development is not common. Professor becomes an explicit mentor on the model of Jesus and his, his disciples. I'll come to that in a second. With the goal of developing the students' God-given abilities to engage in mature exploration and problem solving. Uh, you've got a research project to work with, so you've got something really concrete. And, uh, you know, if you, if you study Jesus' life, he often let his disciples go ahead and, and do something, try something. I set them out, uh, you know, 70 of them. And they came back with a report of all the work that they had done, and he critiqued it, and he, uh, he enabled them to understand things. Uh, Jesus was not above uh, correcting his students, but he did it in such a way that he was constantly developing them, developing their skill to engage with theology and with the world in such a way that they could carry out his mission. So the plan is formative. You are developing your student abilities through the research project rather than merely summative awarding a grade. You might award a grade at the end, but that's that's kind of a, an afterthought. That's, a, that's not really the process. The process is that the plan is formative. You are developing your students' abilities. So, professor focuses more on methods than the product. This is a hard thing to conceptualize uh, because we're so used to looking at the product and saying, what did the student do? Instead of looking at method, how did the student get to that point? Uh, what things did the student fail to understand about method that would have enabled a better product? How could the student use a better method? Working with my students, I'll often say, uh, you know, search terminology is interesting, but if you had tried this search terminology, you would have gotten closer to your research question. Or the research question or thesis itself uh, is vague. It needs some concrete material to it. Uh, it needs to have some bite to it. And I show them how, and I even suggest some possible research questions that would work better than the one that was there. I'm focusing on methods rather than product. I'm focusing on how students do their research rather than on what they produce in their research. Students have the opportunity to read the professor's comments. Comments are vitally important for this. And resubmit any of the faceted assignments so if a student feels that they have not done well enough and that they could learn from the professor's comments, they have the opportunity to resubmit. Not as many students resubmit as I would like to see, but uh, I give my students uh, two more chances to uh, resubmit their material, and some of them do, and, uh, and they improve. Even if they don't, they will improve in the next assignment because they've learned some things from the professor's comments about how to do this well. So. 
Essentially, you're being engaged in competency-based instruction by which you guide your students to the level of ability that you require. Remember that list of excellent things that you want students to have in their research papers? Uh, that's, that's the ultimate goal. They might not reach that, but you're building their competency by the guidance that you provide to your students. It's a change ultimately of mindset from grading to mentoring, uh, from product to process and how that process was conducted. Now, here's the objection. Isn't this a lot of work? Uh, it involves some extra work, but it's not as much as you might imagine. Uh, I mean, many faculty are already moving to uh, faceted assignments because of AI and because it actually works better than just, you know, give me an essay, I'll grade it at the end. And I know you won't read my comments because it's too late because I gave you a grade already. Uh, it involves some extra work, not as much as you might imagine. Your use of teaching and grading time is a matter of values. Uh, the use of our time is based on our values. How important is it to you that your students learn to become skilled researchers? How important is that? Uh, if it's really important, then maybe a little extra time spent here and trimming a little bit there might actually be much more beneficial. The reward of seeing students develop their God-given abilities is significant. I am constantly blessed by my students as I see them struggling in those early assignments. As I as I follow this exact model that I'm telling you about here, I see them struggling in their first assignments. I give them comments. I let them resubmit if they want. Uh, to the end, when they're really flourishing, and then students are are telling me, they're emailing me, "Oh, this was this was so good." I learned so much, uh, I didn't realize how bad I was as a researcher. And uh, this is really rewarding. So here's a sample assignment. This will be a, a first assignment. It looks a bit complex, and you probably need to instruct your students in a few things here. Uh, but here it is. State your topic. Hey, I want to know what, you, what you're dealing with. From a dictionary or encyclopedia in your subject area, explain the nature of your topic in eight to 10 lines. Do not argue a case, but state the working knowledge of the subject matter of your topic. So look it up, even if it's just Wikipedia. Look it up. Find out what the topic is actually about, what its boundaries are, uh, what what sorts of you know, the main lines of thinking in this topic, uh, and uh, uh, state it in eight to ten lines so that I know that you understand at least the basics. Uh, I tell students a working knowledge is enough knowledge that so you can talk about the topic for a minute. Uh, even if you cut that much, it's enough. Brainstorm two or three possible problem-based research questions or thesis statements. This one is difficult for students. Uh, if you look at my research guide, I've got a number of uh, uh, my, my uh, guide that I used for this workshop. Uh, I've got uh, a number of uh, problem-based uh, kinds of uh, research question guides. Uh, that you could use with your students that walk them through how to how to turn uh, information-based research questions into problem-based research questions. Uh, that's a tough one. And then choose the best one out of those two or three and state it in one sentence only. I, I really stress this. Uh, in any project, you should be able to boil your goal down to one sentence. This is what I want to do. And then create an outline of three or four points based on your question, your thesis, and covering the main things you'll have to deal with to answer your question. It's more like an agenda at this point than an outline. Uh, the outline will grow over time. It's an agenda. It's a blueprint. It's a roadmap to enable uh, students to uh, to get to a, a point of uh, actually being able to do the project. The outline I tell my students is a way for you to build confidence about what you're doing, because you can look at it and say. Here is my path. This is what I know I have to do. Instead of saying, now I'm going to spin my wheels for hour after hour and come up with garbage. Uh, three or four points, and you can see the path to the solution. To do this research design assignment, the one that I'm talking about, students need to understand problem-based research question, distinguish it from mere information gathering question. Professor will need to troubleshoot the student's initial working knowledge. Uh, do they really understand the topic? The chosen question or thesis, is it viable? Is it too focused on mere information gathering, et cetera? Is it vague or whatever? And the preliminary outline. 
only when the question and thesis and outline are satisfactory should the student move on. Uh, this, is, this is important. Don't let students leap into a research project when they have a really poorly defined question, uh, a bad outline. Uh, they're, they're, you, you're not helping them, you're hurting them. So you can set similar faceted assignments uh, for other things as well. Information gathering using databases. Uh, here you might want to bring in a librarian, but specifically just to look at databases, not a lot of other things. Uh, evaluation of found resources for quality and relevance to the research questions. So have them list the resources and do a kind of an annotated uh, annotation on each one to say why, why they think it is high quality, why they think it is relevant. And then an assignment calling for a final version of the research question or thesis or whatever it is, and an outline, a final outline, which should have points and subpoints, along with a bibli bibliography properly formatted, of course. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know disciplinary considerations are important. Uh, that's really easy because you as a professor understand your discipline and research in your discipline, and all of your guidance for your students will be based on requirements of your discipline for doing research. So that one isn't a problem at all. Uh, these other ones can really help your students to develop. And then finally, uh, they uh, have a final project they turn in. So it's about a change in your mindset. That's really what it's about. The research ability of students is foundational to them as God's creations. Students will not become skilled researchers without your in intervention. It doesn't happen. They can improve a little bit, but they will never be skilled. I teach, well, I've taught thousands of graduate students, incoming graduate students, and most of them lack the skills. Some of them are bitterly angry that they didn't get this kind of uh, knowledge about doing research in their undergraduate. You know, I got a, I paid a lot of money for my BA and, and I didn't get any of this. And uh, it's true, they they just not getting enough. Say, so don't develop it without your intervention. Uh, research assignment should not be a do it and I'll grade it proposition. If you're doing that, there's no real educational value. Students may learn some things about a, about a topic, but ultimately uh, you're not providing them any guidance beyond your original uh, assignment to them. And uh, a lot of students feel they need to figure it out. That's all they need to do. And they come to me and say, I can't understand this assignment. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. And I walk them through it and I tell them to go back to the professor because I don't want to tell them something that's wrong. But uh, do it and I'll grade it really doesn't work anymore. Mentoring the model of Jesus works better than beer grading. If you can walk your students through the process, and that happens in multiple classes, students are going to emerge with research process skills. The small increase in your involvement with assignments is worth it. So I'm going to close here with a recent testimonial for grad students. This is just a couple of weeks ago. Thanks for the feedback, and it is so helpful as always. Feedback, so important, commenting. Thanks so much for teaching this course. It is one of the most practical courses I have ever had. I'm sure you will hear from me as I journey on the research process by his grace and strength. Greatly appreciated it, happy face. And there it is. So uh, I, I encourage you uh, to have a look at the materials. I'm going to see if I can put the URL to this in the chat, and then uh, I'll, I'll have it there. And uh, um, you can you can have a look at it. It's uh, open access. Or any of you can contact me directly, badke at tw.ca. That's my simple email address. I'm happy to dialogue with any of you about any of this stuff and uh, see it actually, uh, you know, uh, be something that you can make use of as you go through your process. Thanks very much. Thank you, Bill for that excellent presentation. Uh, for those of you who would like uh, to see more of it, I posted some links in the chat room. Um, uh, Bill did a, a four-part series for our faculty and a six-part series for our students at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in the summer of 21. So that was an incredible advantage. Most uh, theology programs, like most philosophy programs, don't teach how to do theology. It's more along the lines of a um, this is the history of theology, or this is the history of philosophy. 
but these um, techniques that Bill has just shared uh, put your program well in the way of creating theologians for the future who know how to do theology, uh, not just um, uh, memorize the history of it. So uh, all of that was completely not on my script. So I'm going to go back to my script. I'd like to remind our participants to post your questions for both of our presenters in the chat room at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A session will follow Stacy Trasenkos' presentation. And now I'm pleased to introduce our second presenter. Stacy Trasenkos has a PhD in chemistry from Penn State University and worked as a senior research chemist for DuPont before converting to Catholicism. She left her career to stay home with her children. In those years, she earned an MA in dogmatic theology and published five books on the integration of science and theology. Dr. Tresenkos teaches online science and theology courses for Seton Hall University, Holy Apostles College and Seminary, and Belmont Abbey College, and is a fellow of the Word on Fire Institute. She is, at last, pursuing a second MA, this time in systematic theology. I'm sorry, in systematic philosophy. Stacy's presentation is entitled, How to Research Scientific Literature in the Light of Faith. Stacy, take it away. Hello. I just want to lead into this by saying uh, you never, you can always tell the Holy Spirit is at work when um, things fit together. I like it when things fit together um, much better than you expected or anticipated. Um, Bill, I really enjoyed your talk and I find a lot of overlap. We're coming at the same question from two very different spheres, but there there is a lot of overlap in the things you said with the things I've been thinking about for years. Um, several years ago, Sebastian, how, how long was it? Probably like six or seven years ago. Um, we worked together on a, a grant with the Templeton Foundation and the AAAS, the American Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, a secular scientific organization, to develop courses to teach research skills at universities or to teach courses about science and religion at U.S. seminaries. So it was a, it was a really good program, and the course that we developed from that um, Sebastian asked me, what, what kind of a course would you teach if you could teach something at a seminary about science? I, I'm a chemist. I'm a, always a recovering materialist. I've studied theology. I'm working on philosophy, but my first love was atoms, um, even before I became Catholic. So um, chemistry kind of led me to Christ, and that led me into the deeper study of theology and philosophy. And so I, I reflected on that question, and I thought, you know, I really think what seminarians and students at the college at Holy Apostles could benefit from is a course on how to read scientific papers. Um, just the thought of that puts a lot of fear into people, and um, you're if you don't have some kind of scientific literacy or some kind of knowledge about how to navigate this landscape of scientific publication, which has exploded with the internet, like Bill was saying, if you don't have some way to navigate that, not just to know who you can trust about the science, but also how to analyze it in the light of faith, um, then you're kind of left always to what biased popular opinion is going to tell you. And 99.999% of the time, they're not going to tell you that science is the study of God's handiwork which that's how we see it. So um, so I, I set out on this, this mission to, to teach students how to see my world, how to see the beauty in the scientific papers for the purpose of knowing for yourself what's true and what is consistent with our Catholic faith, what is contradictory to it and needs to be corrected philosophically or theologically or even sometimes just scientifically. And, um, and then how to name the biggest part of scientific discovery these days is things that are they're not they're neither contradictory nor consistent they're just kind of neutral because they're very unsettled questions um like like what are gravitons <laughs> um so i think that's a useful skill and it fits with what bill was saying and i just want to show you something about what i mean by this so this is a, an example of what bill was talking about i think one of the lessons I give is on the structure of scientific papers. And the reason I do that is because we need communicators. People 
that are studying philosophy and theology and uh, who are seminarians, they need to know how to communicate in this scientific age that we live in. So that's the reason for it. And I, I discovered um, that there is a structure to scientific papers, but not everybody knows that. And so when you look at a scientific paper like the one here, uh, you're, it's overwhelming. You don't know what the title means. The title is certainly not clickbait. <laughs> you don't know what the abstract means. You don't know what the point of the whole paper is. And it, it is not immediately obvious. Scientific papers are written in a very, very different way than the theology and philosophy papers. I've learned that. I've had to learn how to be patient with scholarly research in theology and philosophy and read the whole thing and see it holistically because in a scientific paper, you don't do that. In a scientific paper, you go through the steps very carefully and sometimes you don't even need to read the whole paper to find what you're looking for if you're doing research about a certain question. So I thought, well, it's probably useful just to explain the structure of the scientific paper so people who look at them know what you're looking at and can better make a judgment about whether it's, it's something you even need for your research or not. In the class I teach, uh, it is all research skills, but in this narrow topic of science, it is a struggle for the students at first, but when I, when I show them how to know what the parts are and how to recognize the parts, they then can figure out what the paper is talking about. And they are led through this process where they have to analyze not just one scientific paper, they have to analyze a field of research, find five scientific papers on the same topic and show how the research developed over the years. And then they have to comment on it in the light of faith. They have to not just get the field of research from the scientific papers, they also have to go to the magisterial documents and um, the, the philosophy, and they have to bring that in and explain why this is consistent, contradictory, or neutral in the light of faith. So here's one such paper. And I'm going to show you some of the parts of the paper, and then we're going to look at the paper more carefully, just to make a point that you don't always know what you're looking at and why it's important to know something about navigating scientific papers. So I call scientific papers the atoms of, of research. They are one little step. I say that because a lot of people uh, who come to me over the years wanting my advice on different things that are going on in science and you know what does this mean about our faith, the thing I found myself saying a lot of times is you got to understand it may be published in a scientific journal. This paper in front of you is published in Science Journal, the number one tr most trustworthy scientific journal in the world. It's a global journal. It's a very old journal. They have a very rigorous peer review process. Um, it, it's they they bring the paper and they're concerned about what the one paper says. But I always say it's just one paper. There are thousands of papers published every day now, and um, it, it's one paper. And the reason it, it's just one cycle of the scientific method. It's an observation. It's a set of experiments. It's data and conclusions that the researchers have to put their name on and present. And so it's out there in the scientific community to further scientific research. But scientific papers alone by themselves, they don't make up anything. Just like an atom by itself alone doesn't make up anything. It's just part of a bigger whole. And so understand that and then understand there are different parts to it. So one of the parts, or here's a list of the parts, title, authors, abstract, background and introduction, methods, results and discussion, conclusion and references. There's a lot of parts to this paper. And the way I thought of it was, when, with the first time I read St. Thomas Aquinas, I don't know if you remember it, but I sure do because I was in my uh, 30s when this happened. The first time I signed up for the first theology course at Holy Apostles and I had to read Aquinas, I was so frustrated and I was so lost. And many times I would summarize St. Thomas Aquinas thinking I had grasped his point finally only to be told, no, you were you were summarizing the objection. That's not what he said. That's what he's saying isn't right. <laughs> and and like I did not understand that. 
And so when I learned the process, when I learned the parts of Aquinas's questions and articles and how he structures them, it was so much easier. I understood what I was doing. So it's the same kind of thinking here, the parts of the paper. The title, I'm just going to go through this quickly and then I'm going to show you the actual paper that, that I use for an example. The title can tell you a lot. It does not have fluff. They are not clickbait. They use highly technical language. The definitions of the words in the title are almost always found in the abstract as well. They are, the words in science are very precise. They're very technical and they're almost mathematical. They almost stand for a, a very rigid, precise meaning in the scientific paper. So you will find those words in the title. They mean something to the scientists in the field. They're like little packages that have a whole lot of history and meaning in them, but the scientists in the field understand that word. Those words will be found in the abstract and they will be found in the body of the paper. So the, sci the title tells a researcher right away if you even want to spend time reading that paper. The authors are also a very important part, just like in theology and philosophy papers, the authors matter, but a lot of times in those papers, it's one, maybe two authors. In scientific literature, it's always a group. I don't think I've ever seen a scientific research report or paper that was written by one person because scientists don't work alone. They work in teams of people. And if you worked on the team, you're listed on the paper, even if you didn't write the paper, you're part of the team that did the work. This is also a way that in the scientific community, they promote the students. So the first and the last author are the ones you wanna pay attention to. The first author is usually the one that did most of the work and that can be a graduate student. That's the lead researcher. The last author is the professor who runs the research lab and acquires the grant funding. And the institutions of the authors will also be listed. Sometimes it matters that the authors don't all come from the same institution. Sometimes there is a collaboration across institutions. So the, the, the leader, the lead researcher may be a student first person. The next person who did the next most work is listed second. And then all the other people are listed in there. And sometimes you have a big chunk of, of authors on a paper. And no, they did not all write the paper. Um, but they contributed to the research and they're asked to put their name on the research that there's an integrity thing there. The abstract is to, like all abstracts. It's a punchy summary, not about marketing. It's packed with the most important facts. I teach the students that if you read the title in the abstract and that's not what you need, like Bill was saying, it doesn't have the key words that answer the question you're researching, move on. OK, and that's how you plow through scientific papers. You don't need to, to find that. Um, you don't need to read that paper. You don't need to spend time looking at the methods and the discussion of the results because you don't care about the results for your research question. Um, and then you can read in layers. If you like the abstract in the title, it has to do with the question you're asking. Then read the background. Um, here, and we'll get to the background just a minute. This is a title of a paper, Oligocene Primates from China Reveal Divergence Between African and Asian Primate Evolution. I'm almost certain that doesn't mean much to anyone here. Um, wh why care about this? It isn't immediately obvious, but that's the title. The researchers are then listed there. And if you could see the whole paper, you would see those numbers tell what institutions they're from. So we have four different institutions here. Uh, just from looking at the four numbers. And then in the abstract here, profound environmental and faunal changes are associated with climate deterioration during the Eocene-Oligocene transition roughly 34 million years ago. Um, and I take students through that. They're like, what? Who cares? You got to break it down. Scientific reading is not get the big picture. It's take it one sentence at a time. There were changes in the climate and the life forms that happened with some kind of climate deterioration. It was killing the animals during the Eocene Oligocene transition. That was about 23 million to 34 million years ago, very long time ago. Um, something happened there. It affected primate evolution is what the authors are saying. And, and you can go on to, to read about that and break it down. But we go through this process in my class of breaking down that abstract just to understand what we're talking about here. So there's the title, there's the abstract. 
Then we get to the background of the paper. That's usually the net, the first section when you start reading. It is important in a scientific paper because it's the glue that ties together all the research projects that are ongoing. So if you're a researcher and you're, you've done, you've read the scientific research, you've come up with a new question, you've come up with a set of tests and you've run those tests, you've collected your data and you're ready to publish a paper, you have to write a background section that situates your research into the bigger um, context of all scientific research. So the background will tell you a lot. If you, if you found a paper that has some research you're interested in learning about, the background tells you how we got there. And if you look in the reference section and you look up all the citations that are used in the background, they're, they're usually all citing each other. There's a network going on. And so when, you, when you're trying to find a question that hasn't been asked before, you read all of that background and then you're like, wait, somebody didn't think to ask this question. And then, and then you, you ask it and you pose it and you do your research. That's how a scientist works. Um, and so if you're researching in science, you, you need to read the background so you understand where things come from. With students that I work with on doing this, this is when the light bulbs start going off. They start understanding how this one little paper they're looking at and, and this activity fits into the bigger picture. So in our little one that we were looking at before that one paper, we're going to go back to that. I've got the whole paper. I'm going to show you on another, um, another um, uh, sharing, but it has words in it like thermolithic and the background has the words in it. Thermolithic. What does thermolithic means? It means you like to be warm. I'm thermolithic. <laughs> if it's cold, I run away. I don't like to be where it's cold. I like to be where it's warm. Well, a lot of mammals are the same way. EOT, I just covered that, the eocene oligocene um, transition. What's the context of this research? It's about evolution. And I picked that because evolution is so controversial in, um, in the faith and science question. What did they do? So then we come, once you read the background and you understand the, this research, then you look at the methods. The methods is nothing more than the cookbook section of the paper. I do. Uh, I did a lot of writing for um, National Catholic Bioethics Center in their quarterly journal, um, surveying scientific literature and commenting on any bioethical issues I saw. A lot of time for me doing that research, I was only looking at the methods section because I was looking for, did they use human embryos? Did they use aborted fetal tissue? Um, were they killing human embryos to do this work? Um, be, be, and so you look in the cookbook section to know what they're doing. There's a big crisis. I'm sure Bill knows all about it in the, in the online world right now because scientists can publish so much. Because if you don't want to go through the rigorous peer review process or if Science Journal doesn't accept your research paper to publish it, you more or less can self-publish it with all of these lesser journals who don't have nearly as rigorous a process. And what that means for us out here is sometimes you're not sure which journals to trust because there has been an explosion of journals out there. Some of them will even let you pay them to get your work published, and that happens. Um, and so there is consequently a reproducibility problem because um, there's a lot of there's a lot more stuff being published that maybe isn't carefully vetted and scientists are having a problem now you find a paper it covers a topic you want to know about and if you're doing research in your own lab like actual scientific investigations and you try to reproduce the results of the paper you're reading and you can't well that's a problem you're supposed to be able to that's the reason for doing this and so back in the 90s when I was writing scientific papers and and trying to get published and I, I did publish in science brag brag I, I that was like um, that's the crowning thing if you're a scientist. I, I was fortunate enough to to do something that got a publication in Science Journal. You have to make sure your research is reproducible because if it's not, if you fudge, if you cheat, if you aren't honest, people are going to know. I, I wasn't Catholic. I wasn't religious back then. But even that human part of you, your integrity, you don't want to be dishonest here. But we have a problem uh, these days with that because it because people don't, they're not required by the peer review process to be so honest. But that's a place you can go look. Then, then comes, so you got the 
abstract and the background and the methods, then come the results. Almost in the in the students who take my class, there's not always a lot of need to go through the the careful analysis of all the results. Don't skip it too much, but it's it's a long, very technical part of the paper that's overwhelming. You don't have to read it. <laughs> um, and then the conclusion. Now, this is important, like the the background is. It's like the bookends. It ties back to the background. It resituates the work the scientific team did in the context of the greater scientific field, but it also looks forward. The conclusion is where you say, this is what happened. We're not sure. We weren't expecting these results. We were expecting these results. Here's other tests we did to confirm these results. Here's what's next. And so if you're a scientific researcher and you're reading the what's next and you have an idea, well, that's when you start collaborating and doing your own work in your own lab. The last part, like any paper, are the references. This is very useful for scientific research because this is kind of like a video game where you start um, engaging in the work and directing your own path. And even the students at Holy Apostles that take my class, they're, they're asked to write about a field of research. So they find one research paper that they're interested in. Maybe it's a neuroscience paper talking about how our personalities change as we age. Maybe it's a neuroscience paper talking about why some people think they're born homosexual, or maybe it's about development of the human brain in childhood, or maybe it's about Alzheimer's and that's just neuroscience, or, or maybe it's about um, something in evolution. So once they find it, then they go to the references and they, that's where they're going to find their other papers. And then you get into the second layer and those references and other papers. And so you kind of chart out your own little path of the things you're interested in. And that's how scientists pinpoint new questions. Okay, so that paper was actually about this little guy. Does anybody know what this is? <laughs> He's cute. He has some relevance to us. Um, this is a strepsurine, um, kind of like a lemur. And it relates to this paper and I'm going to I'm going to show you now. Let me see if I can go. I got to stop share and reshare to here. Just have some windows open. Okay. Put this down. All right. So here's something like real life what you might see. Somebody comes to you and says, "Hey, I saw this paper. It's about a filter that shaped the evolution of primates in Asia. What does that mean? I've heard something about the out of Africa theory. I'm not sure what this means to humans. Um, what, what is this saying? Is this saying there's no God? No, it's not saying any of that. It's talking about this paper, but you don't necessarily want to read the secondhand popular science journals. You want to find the actual paper. This, and I, I help students learn how to do that. This is the actual paper right here, the PDF. So now we can look at it a little better. Oligocene primates from China revealed divergence between African and Asian primate evolution. And it talks about these strepsurines. That's what that little guy was with the big eyes. He's a very small anthropoid. What is an anthropoid? An anthropoid is something that is human-like. Okay, so we're talking, we're getting to some, some connection to human evolution as the scientists see it here. And so what are they saying? What is happening? Well, the difference in the African um, anthropoids and the Asian anthropoids was noticed in the fossil record. What does that mean? It means that over the years, this collection of global data has been made to study the fossils of these anthropoid and so you would include in there like the, not just the lemurs and the, but in the little monkeys but also um chimps apes gorillas humans they've seen these they, they saw the anthropoids move they saw them flourish in africa and then move out to the rest of the world but they had to come from somewhere before they got to africa so that's what this paper is talking about primates are the most thermophilic and hence environmentally sensitive of all animals. I'm reading in the first um, line right here of the background. They don't like to be cold. And so what happened in this Eocene Oligocene transition, I'm summarizing the background here, in this EOT period, 
it got cold, the climate changed and it got very cold. And so was there was this mass exodus of primates that were evolving there south down to, they ended up in Africa generally. And, but there were still some primates left behind in Asia. Well, in the fossil record and the study of genetics, there's not a lot understood about what was left behind in Asia because there aren't that many fossils. There, there weren't a lot during this period because they either died from the cold or they moved. If they could move, they survived. If they couldn't move, they died. Well, these little guys couldn't move. They, they couldn't travel as well as the bigger primates. And so they were left behind in Asia. That's the theory. And... Um, there was this continental scale extinction of primates, except for these little, little um, structurings. So what, how do they know that? Why are they saying that? Why is this research group interested in this? Why is this a filter? Well, they talk in the paper here, we collected the primate fossils reported here via careful evacuation and screen washing at this, this site in Asia, in China. So they found fossils of very small primates from this transition period. And, you know, to the evolution question, that's what I say to students who are, who are like, oh, don't we have to disprove evolution? No, we don't have to disprove evolution. That's never been our charge as Catholics. What we have to do is understand that we see science in the light of faith. And we're, we are looking out at nature not just as nature, as Aristotle saw it, but as God's creation, as Aquinas saw it. And we're digging around out there asking about what happened. So when scientists find these fossils that seem to be one little piece in a big puzzle that doesn't have that many pieces in it yet, you know, you're trying, you ever worked a jigsaw puzzle and you just got a few pieces, you're trying to figure out where they go. It is scientifically valid and legitimate to ask, where does this piece fit in? And that's what these researchers are doing. Where do these little fossils of these little creatures fit into the big story of primate evolution? And what can we learn about that? So you read the background and you can get all of that. Then all of this technical language, that's the methods. Don't need to read it. They're, they found teeth. You can gather that from it. They found some teeth. They're cataloging them. They're looking at them. Here's pictures of the teeth. Doesn't look like much to us. But this is what they're basing their piece of the puzzle on. The reason I have students focus on this is because it's a small thing. It's a very small thing. Okay, this, this could be a wrong analysis. This could be a wrong theory. But the scientist has to put something out there. They have to try to come up with some kind of explanation and explain their thinking. Then you get to the discussion of the results. And that's where they're talking about how these primates were moving. And then you get to the conclusion. And so I've identified the discussion, the conclusion here, where they make their claim. And, I, and I've already covered that, that they moved, um, that, that a, lot, a lot of the primates, the bigger ones, made it down to Africa to stay warm. The other bigger primates that couldn't move died. And all that were left behind were these little ones. And then you see over the millions of years after that, a proliferation of those species related to those little primates. Whereas in Africa, that's where they started finding the fossils from the bigger primates, even leading up to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalus, the, the Neanderthals and a lot of others. I don't remember all the names of them, but um, that's the explanation. But you notice here in the very last part that I have highlighted, um, it is tempting to attribute the different patterns of turnover in Asian and African primate faunas across the EOT to local changes in vegetation and paleo, paleo environment. That's another way of just saying all that stuff I just explained. But current evidence is not sufficient to rule out the possibility that stochastic processes also played a substantial role. What does that mean and why is it important? It's the last thing they say in the conclusions. You will see a tentativeness in the scientific, scientific papers, the ones you can trust. They're saying it seems like our explanation about this mobility and this climate getting cold and the survivability in warmer climates. It seems like that's the explanation, but we don't feel like that's the whole story. And Almost every paper you read about evolution 
it's some little tiny piece of the puzzle. They're trying to fit it in. They're saying it doesn't, we're not sure. Um, and the reason they say that is because another team may find more information later. And I think that's a really important point to understand about how science works, because in the actual scientific literature, you don't find a lot of loud mouths who are going around saying evolution disproves that God's existence. Evolution makes it valid to be an atheist, like Richard Dawkins said. You don't find that in the actual words of the scientists for the most part. You do have some. But um, that's another reason to actually see what we're talking about here. This is looking at God's creation, finding some old teeth, and trying to fit them in to the story with our best methods and what we can, what we can do with it. And then here's the, the reference section with the other papers. So um, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, so that is, um, that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. And um, there's, that's only one lesson in the course. Oh, I do want to share one more thing. That's only one lesson in the course, but um, I have, like Bill has, I had developed with another grant. Can y'all see that? The Assessing Contemporary Science and Light of Faith. Did that share correctly? Um, yes, yes, this did. is So um, where Bill was talking about the theology of research, I have been talking for a while about the theology of science, meaning we see science as the study of God's handiwork. And I mean, really, when you take that view, I have been, I know it sounds simplistic, but I've been dealing with this question for like 10 years now. It changes the way, especially students, see things. I teach classes on chemistry and physics and, and on mathematics. And when you have students who are humanities majors, they hate the fact that they have to take a chemistry class. They don't want to have to learn physics. They don't want to have to do math. They're scared of it and they don't think they can do it. But when I explain it this way, like, okay, you're not going to become a scientist, but you do live in a time where you need to understand what science means in a healthy way. And I want you to remember this, that science is the study of God's handiwork. So everything we learn, even from a physics textbook, from a chemistry textbook, everything we learn about the atom, it's not just some stuff you have to memorize. It doesn't really mean anything to your life. It's the very air you're breathing it is how everything hangs together. And this is what the human mind has gathered from observation of the world and processed abstractly to come up with theories and laws about how creation works. And so because we're human, we don't know everything. Some people might act like they do. Some scientists may make conclusions that are unfounded. Science is just our humble groping into nature, trying to figure out what God does. So even if you're not going to become a scientist, when you take a course and you learn chemistry through someone's eyes who loves and is fascinated by the order in the atomic realm, and you learn that and you start to think about, hey, when I'm taking a walk, I'm looking around at the cloud and the trees and the sun, it clicks. There are atoms doing their thing that's responsible for all these behaviors. You see god's handiwork with a new insight and so that's the thing to try to impart to the students along with how to teach them how to navigate this crazy internet world where people can publish anything and science is seen as a god unto itself so many times it really it really makes sense of of humility it may it you suddenly understand why it's important to approach all of this with humility um, understanding, you know, we are understanding, we are literally standing under something greater, trying to figure out more about it. So I have this website, um, the talk I just gave, how scientific, the structure of scientific papers is here. There are six um, videos and little workshops that are there and some books. So this is just a resource, resource for the Center of Theology of Science. And I use it in some of my classes and it's also just freestanding and out there. So thank you for your time. I hope I said something that you will remember or that was useful, um, or if nothing else, just to change the way we, we think about science or how we teach science. Thank you very much, Stacy, for this most excellent presentation. Uh, you can see um, from Stacy's presentation a direct application of the teaching research processes uh, method. So imagine if 
this kind of uh, work that is Stacy is currently doing in the scientific discipline, if this kind of work could be extended into the theological discipline. Imagine theological students being able to engage in research uh, by understanding the uh, processes um, unique to the discipline of theological studies. That would be uh, a new world for the uh, 21st century as we uh, cruise through the mid part of the third decade of it uh, into the 22nd. So uh, we will now entertain questions from our participants. Our QA moderator, Sheila Roth, is iTest Administrative Assistant and board member. So, um, Sheila, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you for your presentations, uh, Bill and Stacy. We have a question first up here first for, up Bill. for Bill. How realistic is it for you to argue that your approach will not significantly increase faculty workload? That's a question I get all the time. And uh, I can I can say, you know, believe me, it won't. But I think what we're seeing in academia in general is a transition away from the single uh, research project that is delivered en masse to the professor at the end of the semester. We're seeing much more of this idea of breaking things down uh, because uh, it's it really works better. Uh, what I can say is, uh, as you work with students in the smaller pieces, you get to know what they're doing. So that by the time it comes to uh, delivering that final paper, uh, you have a pretty good knowledge of what that paper is, what it's, what it's intending to do. I'm not saying it isn't more work, but I'm saying that it's crucial and vitally important work. Uh, if we don't do something like this, we are really not helping our students. Uh, to develop those skills that they need. And those skills are vitally important. So I would say, yes, it does increase workload a bit. It doesn't increase it quite as much as you might think. For larger classes, that might be an issue. But uh, right now, I've got uh, 24 students in one class. I've got uh, an upcoming class with about 10 students that will overlap with that. And I'm just finishing a doctor of ministry course that has a number of students. and. I don't find that my days are filled up with, uh, you know, grading and uh, commenting on student assignments. Uh, it's not nearly as bad as you might think. And it's worth trying out just to see if it'll work. All right, good, thank you. Here's a question for Stacy. How did your knowledge of scientific papers help you read Aquinas? I think in the beginning they didn't it didn't help me um, because I, I wasn't I didn't have the skill to know how to let go of one line that I didn't understand and read the next line. Um, so I, I would approach Aquinas like I have to read everything from the beginning of this and and I and every line has to make sense because if I don't understand this line, I won't understand the next line. So I would get stuck, unable to move forward. and it it took a relearning of a skill to realize that, I need to read the whole thing, kind of like you're standing at in front of a painting in an art museum. A chemist is trained to look at each brush stroke, and I needed to step back and see the whole thing. But once I learned how to do that, then my understanding of the structure of a scientific paper and how that structure is something that's very human. It's it's the way we think. It's a it's a process of thinking. You know what 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 am I going to do? What's the background? What what were my choices and decisions and judgments going into how I designed the experiments? What are my choices and decisions and how I interpret the results? And where am I going to stake my reputation and claim on what can go forward? It's a process of thinking. And I saw that same kind of process in the way Aquinas works. Um, he's very systematic. And um, so realizing the importance of being systematic if something needs to have longevity for knowledge to pass on, you know, through many generations, like the, the great angelic doctor has, um, I, I really, it gave me a better appreciation for what Aquinas was doing, how he deals with his objectors, how he goes ahead and, and says in a very concise little abstract statement himself, what is on the contrary, like what, what is, you know, from reading the objections that he's going to disagree with those. And so you kind of know how he's going to answer the question. 
but he states it clearly, even um, invokes the an authority in many times, a, a legitimate authority. Just scientific papers do the same thing. They invoke a legitimate authority. They cite the authority they're standing on to say what they're saying. And then he explains it. And so there's actually a very close parallel between how scientific papers are organized and how Aquinas organizes his questions. And even if you need to read only a little part of it, that's okay, but you're going to get the whole picture if you read all of it, the objections and the responses to the objections after he makes his point in the middle. But just, it saved me a lot of time. Um, I learned how to do research in layers. So I, I no longer felt like I had to just read this, read this, read this, read this. I could start to see bigger parts, you know, your whole, your learning itself becomes more systematic because you start to learn more about more details and then you start to see how it all fits together. And I think that is the work of any scholar in our day and age is this interdisciplinary ability to see how it fits all together. Because the scientists that are getting PhDs in secular universities, they're not being taught how to do that. So we need people to come in and kind of help glue it all together. Very good. Thanks. Uh, Bill, do you have a, um, any response to that? Well, I, you know, I, I uh, am in total accord with the kind of thinking that Aquinas had in, in all of his work. But I, I think this, this idea of, of putting things together in a way in which uh, you can enable yourself to, to, to walk through an issue, uh, see the various parameters, see the various uh, objections and other points of view, and uh, begin marshalling together uh, the, the uh, knowledge that you need in order to make a conclusion. Uh, I think of uh, C.E.B. Cranfield, who is a, who was a, a biblical scholar. He wrote a commentary on the book of Romans, which is full of all kinds of interpretive controversies on all kinds of things. Uh, uh, you know, not just all Israel will be saved, but, but many other kinds of things. And what he would do is he would list uh, two, three, four, five, six, sometimes even seven uh, popular interpretations of a passage, and he would walk through each of those interpretations, showing which ones should be rejected outright because they contradicted you know, some kind of principle of interpretation, uh, moving towards the top two or three, and then finally coming to a conclusion and expressing his reasons for it. And I, th I think, you know, a lot of that kind of thinking is really important to, to all, all students because we are faced with voices all the time. We are faced with uh, differing interpretations. We are faced with um, different versions of what is a best practice for a particular uh, solution to a problem. And we need to know how to navigate through all of that and figure out why we reject this, why we accept that. All right, thank you. Uh, Stephanie made a comment. It's not a question, but I think it's uh, valuable to comment. She said, Bill, I have a couple of courses that I have been able to make inroads with some instructors. Rather than asking students to submit a thesis statement and bibliography for research paper approval, the instructors ask the students to submit their research question and search terms and then have a discussion with the librarian sources. Then the student turns in their bibliography. Yep. Uh, that can work. Uh, what you'll find is most often the library will begin by critiquing the research question itself. Uh, if there's if there's any flaws in it, uh, the problem with a poorly phrased research question, uh, this is true for sciences just like it is for, for research projects, if you don't have a very clear, concise idea of what your goal is, uh, what the problem is that you're trying to address, uh, you're just going to have muddled work all the way through. So uh, librarians will start with looking at the question. And uh, if it looks pretty good, uh, they'll say, uh, you know, uh, what kind of search terminology do you think we should use for this? Uh, suggest to draw it out of the out of the actual question as much as possible. And then provide uh, opportunities for, uh, you know, how should we how should we search for this information? Uh, what databases should we use? And uh, what advanced features might we use and librarians can help a lot with that. So uh, yeah, it can it can be very helpful. Uh, and uh, it's not the whole solution but it is one way of addressing those issues. 
All right, good. Uh, another question for Bill. We don't want our student students to become librarians. Aren't basic research skills sufficient for students to get their research done? I'd like every student to be a librarian. Uh, not, not in the official uh, you know, Master of Library and Information Studies kind of way. But uh, uh, I talked to my fellow librarians about how we all have librarian brain which is a way of, of thinking, it's a mindset about grappling with information in such a way that we can kind of wrestle issues to the ground and make sense of them. And uh, uh, I think we need much more advanced skills. The, the idea is all through academia has been, you know, you throw a research project at the student, they muddle their way through it, they learn a few things about the topic, and, and that's good enough. And yet we see a world out there where vast hosts of the population are deceived by uh, conspiracy theories. And we see people that, uh, uh, as Stacy said, can't, can't figure out how to make sense of a scientific paper uh, or even, even a secondary source that describes a scientific paper. Uh, can't really find a way to work our way to the, to the truth. And if we can't do that, I think we're failing our students uh, students need to be at a much, much higher level. They might be official, not be official librarians, but they should have some measure of a librarian brain. All right, thanks. Um, a question or a comment from Jeffrey. He said, Stacy said that she teaches online courses and I'm interested in learning more about who takes those courses. Oh, Stacey, you're muted. I'm muted. Yeah, I've, got, I've muted myself temporarily. Um, oh, thanks for your interest. I teach the Reading Science and the Light of Faith course at Holy Apostles College and Seminary in the theology department, but I think um, anyone can take that course. Also, that that um, website I showed you, the Theology of Science, has some has six lessons, six modules on it that I use in part in a course. Um, but the courses I'm really excited about, too, are at Holy Apostles, the physics and the chemistry. And also I have a mathematics among the liberal arts course. So it, it's a math course, but it's math you can use um, for non-math majors. I teach those three courses at Holy Apostles, and they're also part of the Take Credit program. The Take Credit program is a dual credit for high school um, juniors and seniors. If they're accepted into that, they uh, get cr credit for both high school and college credit from the from the college. So um, we get a lot of them from the Angelicum, from the Great Books program. And, um, and I think anybody can sign up for those courses. I would love, I know this is going to sound silly, but welcome to my world. I would love to be able to teach all the theologians and philosophers and seminarians um, just one class on chemistry. I would just love for them to be able to see chemistry because it it's really a travesty in our education system today that chemistry is one of the most hated courses in high school. Nobody wants to take chemistry. Nobody likes it while they're taking it. And, and you know, it's taught without God. It's taught as just, you know, here's some equations, here's some formulas. You have to balance these equations. Everybody wants to break print pencils. Um, and here are, you know, here's some formulas that we've come up with that you can calculate things and you have to do stoichiometry and people get to the end of it and they're, they're like, they can't wait to get out of that class. I talked to so many adults who are like, I hated my chemistry class, no offense. And it, it breaks my heart because there's so much there. If you see it with the eyes of faith, when you want to break your pencil because balancing an equation is hard, that's the time when you get on your knees and you say, thank you, God. For creating such an ordered world that my little human mind is having trouble understanding. But um, when I teach it that way, I, so it's a privilege to me to be able to teach, especially teach non-science majors. When I teach it that way, I, I really do. It's my hope and prayer. And I have heard from plenty of students that this is the case. It just changes the way they look at the world. It changes the way they look around at the air they're breathing, the chemical reactions causing their heart to pump, the trees, the stars, you know, all of it. You, you have a new, a deeper appreciation for creation. So I kind of wish we could just have this program where we go back and teach everybody 
how to really love chemistry. And I actually, something you said, Bill, reminded me of this. I actually say we need to evangelize through science in this day and age. We, we need to sit down and talk science with the atheists and lead them to that question. You know, like, how do you think all this happened? There's a lot of philosophical questions there to, to ask. Um, but it starts by people really appreciating science. And um, that, that's the work I do. That's, that's my life. So thanks for asking that question. That's a great perspective. Thank you. Um, here's a question I'm not sure who it's directed to, either of you. Is it possible to use this process to study other documents other than scientific studies, like papal documents, social essays, et cetera? I think Stacy should take that one. Okay. For me? Um, yeah, and I think what you were saying, Bill, that process is, I think you're, I'll let you comment on it, but I think your process is absolutely useful for doing that, knowing your keywords, knowing what question you're trying to answer. Um, and uh, it is, you said something, Bill, it's, it's a very, it's like the scientific method. It absolutely is. Research is, it's this method. Um, the scientific method is very Catholic. You we, we look at the world, it's very Christian, we look at the world with our eyes, our hands, our senses, we take in sense data, perceptions into our brains, but then we process it abstractly to make sense of it, which is something non-rational animals don't do. And, and then we come up with not just explanations, which are theories and laws, which are things we observe, we come up with more than that. We also come up with ways to predict what's going to happen and ways to manipulate matter so that we can have the digital technology to have a meeting like we're having right now. Um, but but you have it's the search for truth, like Bill was talking about. You've got to constantly be probing and analyzing, probing and analyzing, and you've got to know what you're looking for. I mean, there's certainly a time to browse and and enjoy looking around, like you like you read a magazine, but. If you're if you're searching for truth, you got to know what question you're trying to answer. Ask a question, go find the answer for it. Ask yourself if it makes sense. Ask yourself if you can teach it to somebody else. And that's just a fun way to live your life. Uh, I could say that uh, I encourage my students all the time to uh, make use of, of primary sources, uh, no matter what kind of uh, issue they're dealing with, to find you know the, the basics of from the people who, who actually first said it, first did it. And uh, uh, so, you know, much of the relevant stuff uh, with primary sources has to do with, you know, well, what is important here um, in, in these particular primary sources. I had a student from Rwanda uh, who was uh, investigating the Rwanda massacre uh, situation. And uh, he, he was, writing a you know fairly large paper on on uh, many ramifications of that and who was to blame etc and uh, he asked me to track down a speech done in the united nations by someone who was later assassinated and see if i could find the text of the speech and i i really appreciated that because i thought you know here's here's a student who's actually getting at the stuff that is important and I did manage to find the speech, uh, and uh, uh, he was able to use it, and it was kind of pivotal in his argument that he was making. And uh, it was a speech pleading to the United Nations to do something by a Rwandan who knew that this thing was coming. And uh, uh, so that kind of research, I think, is, is really important. And uh, you can use the same principles. You know, what here is important and relevant? Uh, is this significant? It might be a great piece of work, but if it's not relevant, then you really have to kind of leave it for another time. All right, thank you. I have a question here from Peter. He says, can Bill or Stacy comment on the differences between a scientific research proposal and a theological research proposal? There seems to be a lack of understanding by masters and doctoral students that a research proposal on a theological topic is somewhat of a misnomer. It's less of a proposal to do research and more proposal to write on the result of their research. Um, yeah, and it took, it's, it's unfortunate we don't know as much when we're 20 as we do when we're 50, but I haven't been able to figure that out. <laughs> but it, 
it was a long time before I even understood the difference between master's degree and and doctoral degree. A master's degree, you're supposed to be mastering the content, mastering the subject material, and and teaching, able to teach it. But at doctorate level, doctorate level, you do need to add some new knowledge to the field, and that new knowledge is going to be very different in science, where you you actually literally have to discover something, however small. For me, it was nano bubble pack. Long story. Um, but you, you have to do something. You have to discover something. In, in theology or philosophy, you still have to provide some new insight. You have to put things together in a new way while remaining true to the magisterium and to Catholic teaching. You, you have to apply some new insight to it, or at least that's my understanding of it. And so that is the difference. A research proposal in science, you've read the research you've thought about your capabilities in your lab, you've designed a set of experiments, and you're going to write a proposal to a funding organization to ask for money to do that. I mean, we saw Galileo, right, get into trouble with that because he's like, I know the earth moves. I can't prove it yet, but I know the earth moves. Now fund me. And didn't work so well for him. Um, but scientists are still in that kind of uh, situation where you don't want to overstate but you do you have to have a little bit of research to be able to say, I want to work on this to get the funding to go work on it. And then you publish. That's why you need to publish scientific papers to show that you've done something um, with theology. And somebody else may want to answer more on this. It is uh, like like Peter was saying, it's a proposal to write on the result of their research. So my understanding of a theological proposal for doctoral research is you're you've you've done the research, you've synthesized your new ideas about how it all fits together, your new insights, and you're writing a proposal that, to get permission that it is a solid idea to go and write about it. And you probably will do more research, and of course you will, in writing about it, but you're, it's, it's, it has a different meaning when you say research proposal. Did I answer the question? Does anybody else want to add to that? I think a commonality uh, in, in scientific and theological uh, proposals uh, is that they are all based on one single statement of what the goal is. And I, I, this, this is so very important. Students miss this. Uh, if, if you're uh, doing a, a scientific study, you're going to base your stuff on a hypothesis. Uh, if you're doing a theological paper, you might base it on a research question or a thesis statement. But uh, uh, even if you've done a fair amount of work already, uh, you're still going to propose something that can be boiled down to uh, to a question. Uh, I've been in a number of thesis exams where often the first question asked of the of the student is, "Can you tell me what your thesis is?" And they don't mean explain your whole paper; they mean you know explain the goal. What was the question you were seeking to address? The problem you were trying to address, and uh, um, that's something that students need to do as part of their design. I think everything flows out of that. Uh, whatever you develop by way of uh, in a theological paper, the, an outline of, of what you want to cover, uh, the things that you are uh, going to address, and uh, uh, the conclusions that, that you are coming to, uh, all of that comes out of that initial uh, question, thesis, hypothesis, whatever it is. All right, thank you. We have a question from Craig. He says, have online learning systems influenced pedagogy in ways that do not engage students with the skills of genuine research and encountering the divine? Vis-a-vis, -vis, have professors simplified their teaching to yes, no, or option one, two, three, four questions? How can we champion authentic research engagement with the divine? I guess I'll take a try at that. Um, most of my courses are either online or hybrid. So that uh, for my undergraduate course that, that I teach, uh, I have six sessions of one hour, and then the rest of the stuff is all done online. And I think it's very easy with an online course to turn it into something quite mechanical, uh, where uh, students you know, do some work and uh, read some readings, and uh, there isn't really much of a dynamic presence. Uh, and uh, of course, 
uh, when there isn't much of a dynamic presence, there isn't much that's uh, sort of theologically valuable uh, in the course either. Um, I tend with my courses uh, to let my students know right away that my educational philosophy is that I am going to be their guide. Uh, I am going to walk them through a process and that that means that they are going to have to interact with me. Uh, I invite them to email me if they have any questions. I had one student, uh, she was a very anxious, uncertain person. And uh, she uh, emailed me up to five times a day, uh, every day of the week, including Saturday and Sunday, with questions. And I answered all of those, and she got through it, and everything was fine. Uh, it's in that dynamic between the professor and the student. Uh, I don't do as much student to student, although I, you can do that with forums uh, that can really be quite extensive in uh, students debating an issue uh, uh, online. But uh, I develop a sense of, of community with my students that I think is, is really quite strong. And I do that intentionally because that's the only way that you can really impart those deeper values. Very good. Stacey, do you have a response to that? Just briefly, I, I've been in the online environment since 2014. Um, and I think a lot about how do you do more than just have them answer multiple choice questions? How do you engage the students and, and lead them, like Bill is saying, into formulate, into seeking the truth, formulating clear questions and knowing how to go about answering them? Um, and I... I, I like to see what's going on now in the online environment overall. I know there's a lot going on with artificial intelligence, um, with learning management systems, trying to get professors to learn how to use the learning management systems to set up their tests and quizzes. And how the, there's a big wave of how do we teach in the online environment um, that we're in the middle of right now. But I think it's good that we're asking questions about how to connect with the students better um, there is a place for yes or no and one, two, three, four questions, but they can't be everything. And what Bill's saying, I mean, I, re I really will remember what you said about get them to write the topic question um, and, and approve that so that they're asking they're asking a good question. Um, that I, in research, my professor a long time ago told me that you you can you can ask the right question or you can ask the wrong question and you can go about seeking the answer the right way or the wrong way. So there's there's four different options there in that rubric. You wanna ask the right question and you wanna go about finding the answer the right way. You don't wanna ask the wrong question and find the answer the right way or the other options. So um, I think just imparting that to students is important. And so asking them to do research of some sort, uh, a professor, pushed me a couple of years ago to have um, a, re a research project in my physics and chemistry course. And it's, ju it's just a five minute video the students have to make and they have to do it in teams, which is excruciating for them because they don't want to work in teams in the online environment. But um, but I push them to and there there is a whole lot of weekly check in weekly leading them through the process. What have you found? What are you going to do with it? Is your teammate helping you? But in the end, after getting through all of that, there is a much deeper satisfaction that they've learned something, that they've learned how to think on their own. Um, so I think the more that we start doing things like Bill is suggesting and start pushing ourselves as educators to to ask students to engage in these research projects and learn how to, because we're, we're not just teaching them chemistry or theology, we're teaching them how to think. Um, the more we think about it that way, the more we can actually use the online environment to enable them to to do that research on their own. All right, thanks. Um, do you have a final last statement you'd like to make before we close the webinar, Bill? I think only just to say that teaching students how to be very skilled in doing research effectively and well, up to a level that is far above what we're doing now, uh, is essential. And uh, I think we have to rethink the way we do education entirely so that students not develop not just knowledge, but actually the ability to work with knowledge in a very, very crazy world and to be able to come up with solutions. And I appreciate Stacy's uh, thoughtful look at scientific 
literature and scientific research. Uh, that's the kind of thinking that really needs to be encouraged. Great. And Stacy, do you have a final word? Just appreciate everybody coming out. And I'm, I love that we gather together to talk about these things. It was um, lovely to hear your talk, Bill, and get to know more about what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, both of you. I'm going to send it back to Sebastian. We will um, post things up here. Well, this wraps up our Q&A and our webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in the webinar, especially uh, Sheila Roth for leading the Q&A session, and uh, William Badke, Bill Badke, and Stacy Trisenkos for their excellent presentations. In conclusion, our closing prayer will be led by Dr. Craig Kubik. Dr. Kubik serves as Librarian Emeritus and Senior Professor of Administration at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Texas Baptist College. He is a 45-year member of the American Theological Library Association, and he has served in three different seminaries thus far in his career. He also taught librarian training seminars in mission areas, including Haiti and Myanmar. So, uh, Dr. Kubrick, please take it away. Uh, thank you very much. Shall we pray together? Dear Lord, we thank you for the gift of life today and for your sustaining grace. We pray for our students, our faculty, and staff in our various institutions. We are grateful for the talks that were given today and the wisdom to help us guide our students and faculty. We pray for peace in our world. We ask all these things to you, our Father, through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen.